Hello, everybody. Welcome to our session on participant engagement. Um, if you've been in a webinar with me before, you'll know the drill at this point. What I'd like you to do is introduce yourself in the chat. Um, so could you tell me your name, where you are, where you're coming from? Are you in the UK? Are you in the States? Are you in Cambridge? Are you in Nottingham? Um, type that into the chat now. So I want your name and where you are today. And I can say hello. Harriet from Cardiff, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for starting off. Though it says you're Richard May, which is a bit strange, but fine. Who else is there? Well, uh, well UK Reproducibility. Hi, Will. Hi, George. Hi, Nicola from York. Hello, Ben from Newcastle and George from Westminster and Emily from Leeds. And uh, Danielle, normally based in Reading and George from Oxford. Fantastic. Lovely to see you all here today. Thank you so much. The next thing I'd like you to do once you've said who you are and where you're coming from is... Hi, Edita from Bologna. Thank you for signing in from all the way from Bologna. Could you tell us a little bit about what research you do? It's just really useful for me to know my audience. Um, so do you study children? Do you study language development? Do you study motor control processes? Just like in a nutshell, what it is that you do, uh, because it's nice to see the wide variety of what everybody does. Of course, participant engagement matters in all different research fields. Uh, organizational behavior, video games, stress and mental well-being. Fascinating, George. Uh, Alcohol-related brain damage. Uh, working memory, mass development in children, learning theory and attention, children's innovation and problem solving. Amazing memory, different populations, spatial navigation. Thank you so much for joining in. So everybody still joining now, could you into the chat type in your name and uh, where you're coming in from today? So, you know, I would be Joe from Cambridge and then also follow that up with what it is that you study. And then the third thing I want you to do. So this isn't frivolous getting you to chat type into the chat. I'm going to ask you to do this quite a lot while we're doing our presentation. It's a great way of me getting feedback and knowing what is useful for you guys. So the last thing I, I need to know about the audience before I start talking about participant engagement is what type of research you do. So do you do survey research using Qualtrics or SurveyMonkey? Do you do task-based research using a tool like Gorilla or Psychopie or Presentation or any of the other ones out there? Do you do game-related research using tools like Unity? So that's the last thing I want you to answer is what tools do you use, what type of research you do, and what tools do you use to do it? Uh, my, Mircea, I show people videos, so more control over presentation would be great. Uh, learning much di digital communities with Gorilla, both surveys and experimental research, intervention style questions, uh, mainly task-based, Gorilla, some Qualtrics and online surveys, social experience, most likely small pieces of people in small groups, surveys on Qualtrics, using Psychopie, <laughs> surveys and tasks, task based using Psychopie. It's fantastic, it's such a wide range. Eyewitness identification, mostly experimental, tasks, mostly, mainly standardized measures, E-prime Qualtrics, fantastic. Thank you so much, it's really great to hear from you today. Um, right, so throughout this talk, uh, so to introduce myself, I'm Joe Evershed, I'm the CEO here at Gorilla. Also talking today is Nick, you, Nick, you could turn your, uh, video one just so you can wave at everybody and say hi hello um, good afternoon lovely to see you all yeah nick is our cto and general uh, computer wizard over here at gorilla um we've got our uh twitter handles up on the screen if the mo at, at the moment if you want to follow us um you can also follow us at gorilla uh gorilla experiment builder at gorilla psych and okay. if you want to um uh tweet today then ukrn have said the hashtag is ukrn and eng, eng for engagement uh, and you can tag us at gorilla psych if you would like as well so i just need to move some things around now that we've got you all warmed up so that i can see my slides properly so hi i'm joe overshed i'm the founder ceo of gorilla experiment builder and the host of the behavioral science online conference i've been helping researchers take their studies online since 2012 so over 10 years now as you can imagine, that means I have seen a lot of online research. As part of that journey, my team created the Gorilla Experiment Builder as a single platform for psychological tasks, questionnaires, games, multiplayer experiments, UX experiments, and more. When I was at uni back in 2009, a very long time ago now, I was deeply disappointed that having been convinced of the merits of behavioral research over survey research, for instance, that the tools didn't exist to take behavioral research online quickly and easily. So I was stuck having to learn MATLAB and make do with small sample sizes in the lab. So once I left UCL, I set about creating Gorilla so that researchers could take all manner of behavioral research online quickly and easily and without needing to code. 
Incidentally, that's why we called Gorilla Gorilla. It's a bigger and better survey monkey. To set the scene, you can think of your data quality as a pipeline of five stages. There's your audience supply. What is the pool of people that you're going to pick from? There's your audience targeting and screening, how you decide which of the people from the overall pool you want to invite to take part. There's the study design itself. What controls have you put in place to make sure you're getting the data that you want? There's the participant experience. What's it like to take part in? How long is it? How fun is it? Which changes the quality of um, the data that you get from that participant. And finally, there's the data cleaning. How do you decide which participants and trials to exclude? So I'm going to talk today about the three aspects of data quality that are under your control during the participant experience. So we're leaving out the audience supply and audience screening because that usually takes part from like a, a research crowdsourcing platform. So the three bits we're talking about today are the relationship you form with your participant, the experience you create for them, and the internal controls that you put in place to identify low quality participant data. First up, the scientist participant relationship. To get the best out of your participants, you need to treat them like a valued research collaborator, not set up an antagonistic relationship where you assume they are cheating on you. In simple terms, treat your participants with respect, assume the best in people, but prepare for the worst. This is the trust, but verify thing. Introduce yourself and your research without compromising it. Treat them like humans, not roadblocks. Instructions in plain English, not in penetrable scientific language. Treat them with respect. Design fair attention checks and internal control measures. Don't try and trick them. And treat them with consideration. Put effort into the participant experience so that it is engaging and rewarding, clear and even enjoyable. You want their attention. What are you doing to make sure you've captured it? A useful mental model is to think about the relationship between a manager and a worker. You're the manager, they are the worker. Yes, they work for money, but participants also want to feel valued and to have pride in their work. Are you harnessing that when you're designing your experiment? So what is the exchange that's on offer? In exchange for money, you'll get their time and some of their attention. But you also have other things to offer, which researchers often forget about. You can offer them a rich and well-designed participant experience. You can offer them scientific knowledge that you have that might be interesting or enriching to them. After all, they've signed up to, to take part in a scientific study and are giving their time. They probably have some interest in the science. And you can offer them pride in their scientific contribution. In exchange, they might give you more attention and more engagement with your study, and you'll, as a consequence, get higher quality data. And when you get it right, they'll also give you valuable feedback. We'll come more to feedback later. We all know the stereotype of the poor manager that treats their workers with disrespect, and so the workers do the bare minimum. They only do what they are told and no more. But a good manager engages their workers in the wider vision so that the workers feels empowered to contribute. And in exchange, the workers do just this. We want to create the latter environment in our research studies so that you're getting the very best from the participants that are working for you. The big thing you have to offer is the chance to be involved in the creation of knowledge. That's thrilling. While money is the main motivating factor for participants, if you're getting them through a crowdsourcing platform, the thrill of being part of meaningful research is also a factor. So consequently, ensure that participants know who you are, know what your lab studies and why this is important to the world. You don't need to get bogged down in the detail or compromise the naivety of the part participants, but give participants a sense of meaning to understand their con contribution to the bigger picture. Here's an example of how to do it. Hi, I'm your name. So I'm Joe from the university. I'm from Gorilla. I work in the, the name of your lad. I, I work in the game development lab. We study how games can be used in research. Ultimately, we hope your research will pave the way for making better games in research, whatever it is. We thank you for your time today. Our research wouldn't be possible without participants giving us their time and attention so that we can understand how the brain works. Have a go after this webinar. If we have time, we might try it in one of the Q&A sessions, like creating your perfect intro. So 
I've got, uh, we're, before we move on to the uh, participant experience, out of that section, can you tell me what was the lesson you most needed to hear today? Did you need to hear about how you create the participant um, sci scientist relationship? Did you need to, did you most need to hear what else do you have on offer other than money? Or did you need to hear about how you introduce yourself? to your participants in order to get the most out of them. So was it the introduction? Was it the relationship or was it the offer? In the chat, type which of those three messages you most needed to hear today. I've got the chat open guys, don't let me down. The offer, thanks Harriet. The offer mostly, excellent. What we, uh, Mitchell, what we've heard from people, from researchers who we interview, you don't have to make it informal, um, but they do need to know what it is that, like who you are, what you study, so that they form a relationship with you. Um, when you go, when you see a doctor, they still introduce themselves and you still know that know that they um, they have expertise. So you, you probably need to get your introduction so that it's also conveying your authority uh, and making the participant feel that this is important. Anyone else want to cover which of those three sections they were finding the most useful? I will, I will go on to the next bit. So next up, the participant experience for the overall, for the experiment overall and within the tasks. Obviously, all studies have instructions, but what's best practice here? The weaker version is accurate, but clinical and unwelcoming language. Essentially, what we are trained to write in our method section. You will be shown 100 images on a scale of 1 to 10, rate each image for aversiveness. But because we want our participants to be a research partner, we want to explain the instructions in a more conversational style. In our experiment, you're going to be shown 100 images. In our experiment, you're going to be shown 100 images in four blocks of 25. It will take about 10 minutes, including breaks. Your job is to rate each image on a scale of 1 to 10 by clicking on the on-screen buttons. We're interested in how pleasant you find each image, or how friendly, funny, delightful, or uncomfortable, or how aversive you find each image, how icky, scary, horrible, or uncomfortable. Score aversive stimuli low and pleasant stimuli high. In a different study, we'll be using these images to train an AI to identify unpleasant images so that the AI can be used to moderate online content. This will help us help keep the internet safe for everyone. Do you see the difference? The first one, you'll be shown 100 images on a scale of 1 to 10, rate the images for aversiveness, is clinical. The other one is conversational. And the conversational one is far more appealing. And it's actually also easier to understand because participants can imagine what the experience is going to look and feel like. Think carefully about how you show or tell your participants what you want them to do. We used to have participant information sheets printed on bad printers, so we got used to black and white text-based instructions. But you're on a computer now. You could have text, you could have images, you can even have videos showing them what to do. You can even have practice trials, and we'll come on to those next. The right combination will depend on your study. And we've heard that video instructions are particularly useful by ensuring that participants have to watch them and can't skip them. They watch them at the pace that you set, and you can highlight the important messages and you can show them what they need to do, which is particularly helpful with tasks involving more complex setups like eye tracking. What's the best way of teaching participants to do your novel computer based task? A useful analogy is video games where players also learn a novel computer based task. With video games, we play practice levels with additional helpful on-screen instructions, and we can do the same with our tasks. We can have a few practice trials with additional on-screen prompts or with an auditory narrative talking participants through the trial. Practice trials allow you to use the participant performance to tell if participants have understood the task sufficiently well to give you good quality data. And if they haven't, you can either exclude them from your data analysis or you can ex end the experiment early for them and only pay them for what they have completed so far. To save yourself some, fr fr some frustration, please remember it's impossible to distinguish between data that is poor quality because the participant is shirking from poor data because they are genuinely finding the task hard. Assume the best and pay them for the work they've done. It will cost you far more in terms of time and emotional energy to deal with grumpy participants. And your time is also a very valuable cost, a very real cost. 
If your task is longer than 10 minutes, build in breaks. What are the options here? The right experience will depend on the duration of your task and the function of the break in your experiment. Are you giving your participants time to get up from the computer to go and get a drink and have a comfort break? Or do you need them to, to refresh their concentration? Or possibly you've got a memory experiment and you just need them to have a little bit of time for forgetting. There are lots of different reasons for including a break. If you're giving them a break so that they can have a comfort break, they need to step away from the computer. If the latter, if it's the latter and they need to refresh their concentration, maybe they can play a game-based distractor task. If you do need them to step away from their computer, then there are some further considerations. You can have a page with a break and the participant presses continue when they're ready. But what if they take too long a break and get chucked out of the study due to an overall time limit? Or, and we saw this once, somebody took a break in the middle of experiments and didn't come back for a whole day. And the researcher was like, what do I do? And so they got chucked out and then the participant was sad about this. It's like, I've done so much work. So do need to just be clear to the participant what, how long a break they can take. Um, and then the other worry is if you're asking them to take a break be because you want them to refresh their concentration, they might not want to take a break. They might be like, no, I'm good. I've got enough time. I just want to keep on going. And then they don't refresh their concentration. That can also have an impact on your data. So one way of doing this is with a force break with a countdown timer, and then it goes back into the main trials. But what if the participant gets delayed by the postman or some other domestic intrusion? So one suggestion from a researcher in the US who does hour long tasks on MTurk is that he gives participants a five minute break with a countdown timer. And then when this has elapsed, it goes onto a second screen, which participants have to respond to within one minute in order to regress. Essentially, it's a five minute break with one minute of wiggle room. And this way participants can stretch, get a cup of tea, get comfortable and come back on time, ready to continue. Another way of maintaining engagement is with cute animations and rewarding feedback like you're doing great, coupled with a few fun science facts that relate to your discipline. Uh, Jordan Deacon at Birmingham combined these tactics to maintain interest throughout a long vision experiment with over 600 trials. And she told us that participants giggled during the breaks and seemed pretty content. So how can you use your study to delight and educate? What do you know that's interesting? It doesn't have to directly relate to your study, but it's useful if it's thematically linked. And this can be a great way of disseminating findings from your overall research area. Have you ever had that experience of walking somewhere for the first time and it seems to take ages? And then when you walk home, it feels so much shorter. The route hasn't changed. The distance hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is you. You no longer feel lost and that completely changes the subjective experience. Participants only do your study once, so there's a large danger of them feeling lost. You can reduce this feeling with clear signposts and clear instructions. The main approaches here are a map of your experiment, a progress bar for blocks of trials, and feedback within the trials and providing scores. So this is an example of what a map might look like. You'd show something like this as part of or after gaining participant consent, so that participants understand the different parts of the study and how long each section is going to take. You'll, if you, things are happening in a counterbalanced order, you'll need to find a way of doing this without compromising your experimental controls. But there are ways around that. You can just be vaguer about what each section is. There are two signposts that we see in many studies, uh, progress bars and trial by trial feedback on accuracy and pace. So both are really easy to do in Gorilla. In this video, we can see a tick when they get it right, uh, a prompt to go faster when we go too slowly, and a cross when we get it wrong. And along the top, you can see the progress bar. It fills up as participants complete the trials. Notice also the text in the bottom. Oh, let me go back to that. We've got some text here in the bottom, part two, the task, um, which showing the participants which section of the experiment they are on. Some warnings about these tactics. The progress bar is great, but if you have a stopping rule, be careful how you use a progress bar. There's an easy fix. Just have a clear explanation after the stopping rule has been applied. Otherwise, you might inadvertently confuse your participants that something has gone wrong with the experiment and they might, might worry that they won't get paid. And with accuracy feedback, you're going to have to be careful if you've got a staircasing algorithm. Um, adaptive, like an adaptive algorithm that makes trials harder and easy depending on accuracy. 
this is because it could be if once people are at the top of their level and they're getting one right, one wrong, one right, one wrong, it could be de demotivating getting 50% of the trials wrong. So instead, give motivational feedback at that point, saying great job every few trials. Uh, okay, so that's just finished the experience section. In the chat, tell me which of those experience tips was the most useful for you today? Was it... I'm going to have to work backwards through my memory now. Uh, was it uh, the signposting story of that feeling as a participant that you're lost and that you need to show the overall map? Do showing progress bars, feedback, scores? Um, is it about, I can whip through them again, um, how to include breaks, giving feed, putting snippets of your science into your uh, into your feedback? Was it about using practice trials? Was it about using text? Um, so that was a participant experience. Finally, controls and data quality. This is the third uh, part of our framework. Um, if you want to, there's also a great paper, um, a great talk given by Jenny Rod at this link. Uh, the B online conference. Nick, could you share that into the chat for people that want to watch it? Jenny gave an absolutely excellent talk about data qu data quality when you can't see your participants. Um, so, I'm sorry, I need to pull up my slides. Yes, um, it's a sad fact of life that you'll never get 100% data quality, whether you're online or in the lab. You may be excluding participant data for failing on a range of different measures. And this is the most important thing, is you're not just excluding data for one reason. There are lots of different ways that you and reasons that you might exclude participant data. You And there are different ways of testing for each type of um, poor quality data. And you need to use the right um, test for the right type of check. So you might have attention checks which are really good for excluding bad participants or bots. You might have internal control measures that test whether good participants haven't understood the instructions or are shirking in a different way. Um, and you may have debrief questionnaires, whether they saw through your experiment or if they cheated on a memory test, for instance. Once you accept the need to exclude participants, it makes the process far easier to manage as you simply need to uh, over recruit by 10 or 20 percent and define unambiguous ways of excluding participants whose data doesn't doesn't meet your quality criteria. Once you've defined these exclusion criteria, it makes sense to pre-register them so that you can't be unfairly accused of cherry picking your data. And how do you know what the right qu criteria are? You need to run a pilot study. More on this later. Based on your quality controls, you're going to make two separate decisions. One, whether to pay your participants, and two, whether to include their data in your analysis. The general rule here is that you should pay for the work regardless of the quality and don't hire that participant again if they didn't do good work. But don't try and not pay participants who've given you rubbish data. It's just not worth the fight. So what are the options for identifying if participants are paying attention? I'm going to show you an antagonistic option, a neutral option, and a fair option. The classic version is the attention check or instructional manipulation check. And we know participants don't like them. It's hard not to see them as assuming the worst in participants and therefore antagonistic. And I find it hard to believe that a question like this tells us much about performance on a much longer behavioral task, for instance, a Stroop task. So here you go, this is a bad version. The color test you are about to take part in is very simple. When asked what your favorite color is, you must select the second to last option. This isn't considered fair because there's no cue that you need to read the detailed instructions. You could just very easily just go, what is your favorite color, red? Why do I, why do I need to read this, this um, italics uh, text? Everything that I've been trained about reading forms online is that if I understand what reading in bold says, I, I, I should just go ahead and answer it. Um, a better example is this one. Based on the text you read above, what colour have you been asked to enter? The colour test you're about to take part in is very simple. When asked your favourite colour, you must select green. This is an attention check. But then this doesn't ask what your favourite colour is. So it's again, it's somewhat confusing. I, I don't think these are a great way to 
to test for attention. This is why participants don't like them. Um, but uh, I think a lot of crowdsourcing platforms do allow you to use these to um, exclude participants and say you're not going to pay them. A different approach is an easy task that you're highly confident participants will be able to complete if they are paying attention and not shirking. In the first task, the participant is shown silhouettes of animals that my two-year-old can accurately name, although she can't yet type the name of the animal because she can't write. And then all the participant has to do is type in the name of the animal and press return. So cat, dog, snake. And in the second, the participant has to click on the, on the cat in the array of dogs. Again, my two-year-old can do this task just fine. So this is a way of checking that it's not a bot who's taking part in your study or checking that a participant, when the task is easy, is paying attention and doing their best. And you can use that as a measure of, should I include their data or not? You can't use it as a test of whether you should pay your participants or not. Um, usually we have lots of other examples of internal controls measures that you can find at this link as well. The final type is to ask participants to describe the task instructions in their own words. This is a transparently fair question to ask your participants and in both piloting and your final experiment allows you to identify participants that haven't understood the task. Um, so earlier on in the instructions, you'd say something like this. Later in the experiment, I'm going to ask you to describe the task instructions to me in your own words. This allows me to make sure that you've correctly understood the task. Please do so in your own words. Don't copy the text from the instructions. It's really important I can assess your understanding. Totally fair request to make of your participants. And then like, early on in your experiments, made a, maybe a third of the way through, you do something like this. Remember I said earlier that I'd ask you to describe the task in your own words. Now's that moment. In your own words, describe what the trials look like and what you're meant to do for each trial. Thank you. And you can use that to make sure that your participant has understood what they're trying to do. The normal place to assess participant naivety and cheating is in your debrief questionnaire. You want to find out if the participants guessed your hypothesis and experimental conditions. You might want to exclude them if they did. So if you're doing memory research, you might want to find out if the participant took notes. Researchers doing memory research tell me they explicitly ask the participants if they wrote down any of the answers. And that answering honestly won't change their pay and they just need to know for the science. The last thing to look at is how we get better at designing and running experiments over time. We don't start out as experts, but set up the right conditions and we can get better. How do you get better? You need feedback. You need feedback from peers, feedback from participants, and feedback from the participant data. Another great tip is to take part in a few studies. Sign up to a service like Prolific, take part in 10 studies. You'll learn so much about what it's like to be a participant, and what's nice, what's unpleasant, um, what works really well. And that will improve your craft because you now, can now better imagine what it's like to be on the other side. How do you get feedback? pilot studies. Only your participants, their data and their feedback can help you design an engaging, rewarding, clear and even enjoyable experience. As you become more skilled designing the participant experience, the better your first attempt will be. The typical piloting process is shown above. First of all, you do personal testing until you think it's good. Then you get your supervisor to review it. Um, that's just another M equals one. Then you might get some colleagues or friends or family to take part. Um, and then you do a small online pilot with maybe 10 to 20 people. This is the great place to get feedback on how the participant is understanding the instructions. And that's where that question, did they understand the instructions? Do you have any feedback for me? Um, the importance of setting up the participant relationship, because the better the scientist participant relationship is, the better quality feedback you're going to get at the end. Then you probably want to do and you'll repeat this as needed until you're confident your participants are succeeding at your task the way you want them to. Then you'll probably do a power sample just to make sure you've got your sample size correct. And then you'll finally deploy the experiment. If you want to know more about this process, there's a really excellent talk at the online again by Emily Breeze called Piloting Pitfalls and Progress. Nick, could you pull that link out and put it into um, the chat, please? One worry about the piloting is the additional costs involved. So this slide is to convince you that the additional investment will give you a good return on data quality. Consider a typical research project. 
the fixed costs of a postdoc, including salary, overheads, equipment, conference fees, publishing fees in the UK are around £52,000 a year. And so if we, let's say on the back of that, we just do one study using Gorilla and Prolific, you've invested overall £53,000 and you have got your one study, 200 ends, 80% power, 50, 15 minute study. If we just put in a few more pilots, keep the power the same, keep the study size the same, keep the 15 minute study the same, we've increased our investment by £2,000. We've only increased our investment, our total budget by 4%, which gives us a 300% return on the quality of the data that we're getting out. Now, this doesn't make the data 300% better, but it does make it better for a very small additional uh, investment. Better data means better research, and better research should ultimately lead to more citations and more impact. But we can go further. Rather than just running one study at 80% percentile, why not leverage the work you've done and run three variations on a theme at 90% power, 95% power? For a modest increase in overall budget, here we can see 9%, so now we're spending £6,000 on, on running our studies rather than the original £1,000, while keeping all the other costs the same. For a modest increase in the budget, 9%, you increase the investment in the experiment data by a massive 600%. And it's not, and it, this is not much additional work. It's not 600 times more work to, to do those variations of the theme. If you already have a grant and there's no budget, there's not much you can do, but you can resolve for future grant applications to check that the percentage being spent on designing the participant experience and piloting and the data collection is enough. Here's a useful analogy to think about. Under investing, in, under investing in the participant experience and data quality is like building a Formula One racing car, a feat of science and engineering, just like your research, and then only putting one litre of petrol in it, when you could have put in 10 litres in it and gone that much further. So how do you get better at the experiment design? When piloting, you can look at the data quality, look at attrition and where it happens, Ask for feedback, various stages of your experiment when piloting, and ask for feedback at the end of your study. But the main thing to do is to ask the participants if there is anything else they'd like to tell you. People love to chat, and people love to share their thoughts. Ask a question on anything else, like this one. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? Once you get good, you'll start getting comments in this book. Things like, thanks for including me in this study. I hope your study works out. Good luck with your study. Good luck with your research. Your research is so important. Really grateful that, they, that you're doing it. Um, there are, these are all signs that the participants are engaging in the research as a research partner and not just as a cog. So to summarize what I've shared today, treat participants as a research partner, not a cog. Create an engaging and rewarding participant experience. Include and pre-register a variety of data quality controls and use progressive piloting to improve the participant experience and data quality. So one question for you guys, of those four um, sections, what was the section you most needed to hear about today? Did you need to hear about uh, the making your participants a research partner, creating an engaging participant experience, the data quality controls, or the progressive piloting and getting feedback on your study. In the chat, if you can, tell me which of those four big ideas you wanted, you most needed to hear today. Number three from Kathleen, data quality controls, three, progressive piloting, three, participant experience from Sarah, three, error controls. So the data quality controls are the bits that were really the most useful. Fantastic. Two and three, where research required a person for one minute after if the uh adam that's such a great question what he did is he 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 would say up front that he wasn't going to include them um and then he would actually just let them continue and he would still and then he'd look at the data quality so it was a way of giving himself a measure of whether to include them or not and it um but he didn't actually give himself the fight with the participant because gosh who wants that um, and often you do have to just make these trade offs of going, it's going to make take me more time to have the conversation with the participant than the cost of just paying them. But it gives me a really useful measure on looking at their data a little bit more carefully to see whether I want to include it or not. Um, that's all right, Adam. OK, so that comes to the end of the first section of our presentation. Are there any questions for me at this time? 
Which of those three sections, just to get it started, which of those three sections feels the most daunting? But I was also happy to take questions in the chat. I can see them if anybody has any. Nick, do you want to start getting your slides ready? Uh, yeah, I'm ready when you are. OK, I will take the silences that I did a good job. You don't have any questions at this stage, um, but do keep on answering questions in the chat. I'll do my best to answer them as we go. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, Nick. Uh, OK, can everyone see my slides? I can see them, Nick. Fantastic. All right. Um, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nick. I'm Joe's colleague here at Gorilla, um, and I'm going to be talking about how we can how we can do all those things that Joseph been mentioning really easily. Um, so to to kick things off, um, so I think like everyone, I'd say uh, I think I know a lo lot of you are probably thinking like Joe, this sounds great and lovely, but you've basically just given me masses more work to do. Right. I spent ages getting my task to work. I've been through it hundreds of times to make sure that I'm missing stimuli. I've quadruple checked the randomization. The very last thing that I want to do uh, is to risk breaking it by trying to add all this extra stuff in here. Right. So how many of you are feeling like this in the chat? How many? How does the prospect of adding all these all this crazy stuff to your protocol feel? <laughs> it is a lot. As much. Yes, it is. I know there's a lot in there. And everyone else is so overwhelmed. They don't even want to chat, put anything in the chat. I know how you feel. So one of our mantras at Gorilla here is this shouldn't be hard, right? We're here to make your lives easier. It shouldn't feel like this poor, poor chap in the slide. It should feel like this. That's more like it. That's how we want this to be. Um, I'm not just being frivolous with this. We know that all of this advice that we're giving doesn't help if it's onerous to actually follow. Right? We believe that adding these things to experiments should be a simple case of flicking a switch or just pressing a few buttons. And crucially, these these are should be important design choices that you get to make out of um, based on the merit to your study, not simply an impossibly high standard that you aim for but could never reach. Now we've had researchers uh, tell us that the it used to take them three months to code their task up by hand and they could put together in our tools in a matter of hours. So this just shouldn't be hard. This is where we want to go with this. So I want to take um, a few examples of some of the things that Joe mentioned and let's jump into um, some ways in which we can do this easily. So I've got a little task here. It's like a little puzzle game. You're given a three by three grid with a missing piece and you've got to figure out which one goes in there. So we've got some instructions and then here are just some of the trials. You've got to work out which one goes in that bottom right hand corner. Um, I think that one's the cat. Uh, let's go for the lamp shade and um, I don't know, uh, probably the burger. Let's go for that. Um, <clears throat> there we go. So. You build your task, as Joe uh, described, you show it to someone, they say, oh, we should probably do some practice trials uh, where it tells you whether you're correct or not, right? Let's put some feedback in. Okay, uh, let's do this, nice and simple. Um, here's the trial you're just looking at um, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our builder. Um, so you can simply add a new object here, add a feedback zone, put it in there, and you can actually preview it directly in the tools. We can actually just do that one trial on its own. So let's see, if we do the cat, we get it right, and there's the tick. Uh, let's check one of the others, make sure it's behaving itself. Yeah, the snail, that's not right. Great. So that's how simple this should be. That was that was 30 seconds. And so, okay, cool. Then you get further feedback. Maybe you then take this to your PI and they say, hey, oh, this looks great. But I think uh, as well as that, we should do the practice trials and add a screen at the end and that says like, oh, they where they can do the practice trials again if they want to. And you think, oh, uh, okay. Um, again, not a problem. Um, let's do this one. So. This is the spreadsheet in your task. This is the bit that defines how we do it. So you can see we've got the instructions, the three practice trials, um, and then I put in this new practice complete at the end. So this is just a simple screen. It's got some text and a yes or no button. And what we're going to do here is add a um, add a sort of a, a, a branching zone here where we're going to jump to a row depending on what they say. So if they if we get the response yes, we're going to jump back to the spreadsheet row that was the first one that had the um, that had the practice trials in it. So if we go ahead and preview this, um, we can have another go. There's our instruction screen. Um, there's, we can see the feedback's coming through now. No, it's not the clock, silly. Um, oh dear, would you like practice trials again? Yes, and we jump back again. And this time we can get it, we can do a, bit, we do a better job. Um, and that one was the bug. And this time we say no, and then it goes into the main trials. 
So again, it's just a few button clicks and we could put in these kinds of features. Um, and if you then take it, take it back there again, it's like, oh, that's really good. But I, I was thinking about this in actual second thought, if they get any of the practice trials wrong, then they just have to do them again. Let's not give them a choice, let's just force it. So you take a deep breath and you go, don't worry. Um, again, this is easy. Um, let's just go back to, um, back to our trial. And what we're gonna have to do to do this is we're just going to keep a, a record of how many mistakes they make. So we're going to save their axis um, into, a, into a field. So we're going to say we're going to store the number of mistakes in here. And then when we go back to our, um, our practice complete screen, we can just then just change the criteria on our jump to row here. So instead of it being a response, we're just going to say, look, if the number of mistakes that they've made uh, in here is, if that's greater than zero, then we're always going to jump them up. So now don't worry if you're not completely following every click on the UI. The key thing to take away is how quick it is to add this stuff in. Like most of those things took less than a minute to wire up. And we've got plenty of samples and examples on how to do all of this. And um, I know, and, uh, and I've, been, I've been programming for nearly 20 years and I know it's much faster for me to do all this in a UI rather than having to code it up each time by hand. And I don't know about you, but I can't afford to spend hours doing this for every single task. I just want to click a few buttons and just do it the same way each time. Um, so that's how that's what we're going for here. Um, let's look at another example. So scoring, Joe mentioned scoring. Um, so here I've got another simple little task where you just get two faces. You have to press um, right if the human is on the right and left if they're on the left. Um, and sometimes there'll be no human, so you have to inhibit and then you get it right. Uh, so we've got our feedback in there and then you show it to them and say, oh, let's let's put in the score so they can see how many if they, can, they can see how they're doing. OK, um, again, we wanted that we don't want this to be complicated. This should be a thing where, like, oh, no problem. I can add this in. Um, so we're going to add the, the sort of actually the one you saw before where we um, where we saved their accuracy. But this time we want to know the total number of correct answers. Um, so we want the total correct ones. Uh, we'll add this to our <clears throat> add this to a field in our store uh, called correct. Uh, and then what we can do is go back to the actual screen and um, and, and put it on there. So we're going to make a, a piece of text over here. Uh, we'll sort of put up in the corner up here somewhere. And what we're going to have it do is rather than it being a, a, a bit of text that's always hard coded, we're going to bind it to that field that we just created. So we can say, OK, whatever, whenever you we put this text field in, um, just always show that correct field, whatever that number is. And if it's empty, we'll just show zero so we can style it. Uh, let's make it a bit bigger. And it's probably a bit weird just floating there on its own. So let's put a little star next to it or something just so that we go like, OK, that's that can be your points. Um, so let's just add in uh, a little star graphic here. Um, there we go. And um, and then what we can do is we can just move that up and position it next to next to our score. Um, so that for every um, for every correct trial, we get a little star in there. Um, let's see how that looks. Um, that should be nicely set up. <clears throat> so here we go. Here is our trial. So the first time uh, we go left, oh no, we got it wrong, and you can see the score in the corner didn't change. And this time we get it right, and now the score has gone up by one. Uh, here, this is the one that doesn't have anyone, so we don't do anything. Again, it goes up. And then finally, uh, I think I get this one wrong. There we go. So the score doesn't change. So again, another nice, easy way just to add this in without it being huge and sort of onerous. Um, another example I want to show you doing it, doing it slightly differently is with progress. So Joe mentioned progress bars and also this idea of having a map of your whole, of your whole experiment. So I've made three little screens here that I want to show at different parts of my experiment. So there's step one, where they do the demographics, step two, where they do the first task, and step three, where they do the second task. So I've created a very, very simple little um, task in here. It's just a task with a single screen that shows that, um, shows that map graphic, uh, which is there in the middle. And what I've done is I've bound that to a manipulation so that when I use this task in my tree, I can then configure which of those three map, uh, map files we're going to show. Um, and, and I can just select the one that I want to set at that point. So if we go to the actual experiment, so here's my experiment. There's my demographics. I've got a change minus task and stop signal task in this one. And what I can do here is say, um, now these are all nice self-contained tasks. I don't have to go in and, and uh, edit those ones directly. So I can just add my progress task in here. And I'm going to, uh, if I open it up, I can see there are the three map images that I want. So this one should be map one. And what I can do is I can just simply wire it into my flow really easily. Um, so I can say, OK, well, we want to go from the start. We want to see the progress. Uh, let's just move everything down a bit so we can see how um, we've got a bit more space here and then wire that into my demographics. 
Um, we can do the same trick for the other ones. So um, we can go ahead and just clone that one. And what you'll see here when we switch this one over to be, obviously this one needs to show the second image. Um, when we go back into the tree, we can see that Grilla is showing us what's different between those two progress styles. The same task, but it's configured differently. And we can see that that's changed. Um, so that's the third one. And then then we can just simply rewire everything really quickly. So we need the first map demographics, then we want to see the second one. Uh, then we do the first task and then we do the third one. Uh, and that's it. And there it is. Um, so let's go ahead and see how that looks. So there we go. There's what we say, <clears throat> we're going to do the demographics first. And then I fill in my, my demographics form. This is obviously just a very simple one that I'm using as an example. Um, and then we go, okay, and now on to task one. And away we go. And then we go on to our change blindness task. Oh, well, I'm not going to, I won't make you sit through the rest of the protocol, but you can see how we weave that in. Now, just going back to the tree, the nice thing about this is that all these bits are modular. You can put those map images in without having to embed them in your actual tasks. If you want to use that change blindness task again, you don't have to go in and remove screens that were specific to this study. It's all nice and self-contained. And there's a lot more that you can do here as well. Now, we're obviously focusing on participant engagement today and all these other and those kind of ideas. But the same thing also applies to things like experimental controls, randomization and counterbalancing and so on. You can control all of them in here too. Um, and then finally, we have lots of other resources to make this easy. So again, we want to all these extra bits that we're talking about, all the kind of things that Joe's mentioned that aren't the core part of your actual experimental tasks, um, we want to make all those really easy. So as she mentioned, we've got bot checks that you can just slot in, as I just showed you with the experiment trees, like when someone asks for a bot check, oh, great, stick it in the beginning, fine, done. Um, we've got consent forms and demographic forms that you can take and uh, quickly adapt rather than having to design them from scratch each time. We've got an ever-growing library of tasks that you can either include directly or use as a starting point for your own ones. And finally, we have open materials, which is our, uh, allows research to publish tasks and questionnaires to a public repository where anyone else can clone and use them. So if you're running a replication, if you want to include a task from a particular paper where they publish their resources, you can find it on open materials and just use the exact same one. So no sending emails off into the void that don't get any replies, no need to track down the original author who's since moved on to a different university. It's just right there. So I hope that's given you a view of, of how um, you can take all of the things that Joe's been talking about and, and put them in your task really easily and not feel overwhelmed by them. So um, well, I know we're going to go into a quick break soon, but before we do that, are there any questions on that section? Is there anything um, that we've talked about uh, today that is still holding you back or that still looks too hard? But just setting up right from the beginning, especially cost it if we mess up. Yes, absolutely. And that's something that we're, um, because of these modular bits, we're trying to, I, one of the things we want to do there is isolate these different sections of the experiment from each other. So if, um, so the nice thing about putting in a bot check or putting in something at the beginning is you, because you know it's completely self-contained and separate from your task later on, um, you know, it's extremely unlikely to break anything further down the line. If your study is all in one big thing, if it's all one big script, if it's all one big lump, um, then it's, it, it does can it can end up feeling brittle and it can be terrifying to try and get in there and, and make some changes. Um, oh, thanks, Martin. <laughs> I know you going. And uh, reading, rereading Harriet's one again, um, knowing where the tools are more than anything. Yes, and signposting them. Very cool. Um, all right. Let's say. Um, Let's say a break now, Joe, and then we'll go, come back at two o'clock. Excellent. Was that a lot the first hour? <laughs> <laughs> I realise we cover quite a lot of content very quickly. OK, well, we'll be we'll be here uh, for the next 10 minutes. Uh, Nick and I, or, well, at least one of us will be here. Um, uh, so you can continue asking questions in the chat. We're very happy to discuss. Um, any ideas and then in the second half of today we're going to go on to i'm going to present some ideas about gamification when gamification is useful what gamified what gamified research has been done before successfully and then nick's going to show a little bit of what type of gamification can easily be set up uh in a tool like gorilla so that you can give these ideas uh, a go as well if you want to um and i promise you that the being able to do these things are well within your reach and are not too onerous and will not leave you feeling overwhelmed and will massively improve your participant experience so maybe that's enough uh, to make you think it's worth coming back and having a listen um as i said earlier i've been helping take this 
taking researchers take their studies online since about 2012 and often we've used gamification techniques to increase participant engagement and motivation and consequently increase data quality in scenarios that would have otherwise been impossible to collect data so oftentimes using games is not so much about improving the data quality marginally it's about making possible to making it possible to collect data in situations where it would otherwise have been impossible please do keep that in mind So first of all, what is a game? A game is a system in which players engage in a fictional challenge defined by rules, interactivity and feedback, which results in a quantifiable outcome, often provoking an emotional response. In experimental tasks, we already do a lot of these things anyway. We, they're defined by rules, there's interactivity, there's feedback, there's a quantifiable outcome. All we're missing is the fictional challenge and the emotional reaction. So to take the psychology task the rest of the way only involves adding that narrative and creating a positive emotional experience rather than having tasks feel like a chore. And let's be honest, oftentimes our tasks, our traditional tasks, do feel like a chore. They might not be brilliant games that will be on the next PlayStation being sold for £50 each, but they are still games, just. At least they're research games. If you want to read more about the taxonomy of games, I will put a link in the chat. Um, I'll do that in a minute. So don't seem to be able to pull it out. Let's look at some case studies. Uh, this project was for Dr. Joshua Bolsters from Royal Holloway. I'm showing it because it's one of the rare case studies where we have a before and after videos uh, and it has most of the components of a gamified research task. So the one on the left is the lab version and the one on the right is the gamified version. But under the bonnet, they're exactly the same task. This task is a two alternate voice choice task that are commonplace in neuroeconomics and decision making. Here we have an unarmed bandit where you choose between slot machines or cards and try and find the one that pays out the most. The gamification techniques in this project involve a narrative. You're in a casino, try to win. It's obvious what you need to do, right? Because of the setting. You can see the score up in the top corner. Here's your score. Uh, 85 for the moment and it's got easy to understand and pleasing feedback and all you have to do is try and get your score as high as possible you have the smoke when it's when you've made the wrong choice um, and you get this puff of stars when you make the right choice uh, if you want to know more uh, read more about this project then here's the link so when should you consider making a game um, in that last example, we saw some different aspects of gamification, theming, narrative, scoring, animations, particle effects. Those are like the puffs of stars and smoke. Uh, what we didn't see in that version, because it was just a bit, was using trophy cabinets. How do you decide which technique to use? More importantly, the way to ask that question really is what problem does each technique solve? So in this next section, I'd like you to think about whether you've had any of these research challenges and what impact, impact gamification would have had on your data or whether gamification would have enabled researchers research that you had assumed was impossible. OK, gamification helps a lot with dull, repetitive tasks. Unfortunately, not every task protocol can be rich and rewarding in itself. Some just aren't that fun. And as a result, we run into problems with participant engagement. Participants get tired. They get bored, attrition goes up, and so on. For these kinds of tasks, creating a fiction around what the player is doing and why can go a long way to addressing these problems. In this study, we created eight different go no go tasks and stop signal delay tasks that kids completed 10 minutes a day for over eight weeks. So, this was the intervention to see if we could train executive function. Overall, the kids completed around 4,000 trials of a boring go no go task, and they still reported enjoying the games at the end of the study. That's extraordinary. Imagine if you could get kids training or adults even training on something for eight weeks, 10 minutes a day, what research question would that allow you to answer? Let's have a look at what uh, we did for Nikos Steinbeis. Um, so what happened when they first uh, logged in, they chose their own avatar. This was about giving somebody some agency, which is an important component of gamification. Then there were the instructions. Uh, you've got to go to this mountain and collect. he needs some gold so that he can give you the parts for your plane that has crashed. And you go through these different landscapes. There were some magician's choice choosing which cave you want to go to so that you felt like you had some agency. And this is the go, no go task. So you either had to click to smash the stone 
um, and get the gem or inhibit. Uh, you had to smash to get the coin and inhibit to get the gem. In this one, we have to click when there isn't a dragon. And then if there is a dragon, we have to inhibit and then we get the gem. And this is one of the other landscapes. So we had, had different artwork for different landscapes so that each week the landscape changed. And this was part of the journey from going where you were all the way to the mountains and then back again. This is another one where you have to turn to get the coins based on the instructions. But every now and again, you're given a later instruction like that one where you were told to go and then you have to not go. And the timing on these were getting harder and harder and harder as the game went to try and train this inhibition, this ability to inhib in inhibit. I don't know about you. I, I The traditional go, no go task, I will not do it. <laughs> so dull um but these were quite fun to game with it and the kids enjoyed playing them so dull repetitive tasks is one place where games can be useful another place we can use them is for educational research um so it, other times our task is perfectly interesting but our protocol is just long for whatever reason we need our participants to get through a lot of trials we can end up with some of the same challenges boredom fatigue attention and so on this is where points and rewards can be effective. Rather than just doing trials over and over again, there is now a point to it, and crucially, a point to make progress and get to the end. And everybody likes having a target and getting points and adding things to their basket. We just enjoy these little things. So this video, this was treat, um, this was for Dorothy Bishop. Children with developmental language disorder really struggle with placement language. So put the crab or wheel above the bat, put the wheel below the bat. And this was a way of giving these children a lot of practice with these um, relative statements. So here, I think you're, you click on this button and it gives you an auditory prompt, uh, which I think in this case is um, put the wheel above the bat or below the bat. And so when it's right, you get a puff of stars and the, the screen lifts and you get your gem. This one I think is put the chicken below the bed. And if you take the chicken and you put it above the bed, we don't tell the kids they got it wrong. It just doesn't work. And so you keep on trying. So this is a way of building a training task, which sort of teaches, but without criticism and can. And what's wonderful about the computer is it can be endlessly patient. And as you can see from the four by four grid, the, the statements could get more and more complex as the students were learning things. So it could be put the when the more spaces were available, it could have been something like put the shirt next to the heart that's below the bell. And then you'd have to work out you need to put the heart below the bell and then the shirt next to that and so on. So another good place is with education. Another good place to use games is for educational research where you need that adaptive feedback at exactly the right level of difficulty again and again and again. A third scenario is to give meaning to otherwise somewhat meaningless tasks. Sometimes task instructions are difficult to understand in the abstract. Human cognition deals a lot better with narratives. A game narrative allows us to bypass the confusion while making the task fun. Here we have a range of tasks assessing motor function. Let me play this video to you, which are easy to understand as part of game. This one, you just have to tap the balloons as quickly as possible to burst them. You get 10 seconds and you can measure quite a lot about motor function on how, how many you can pop. This one is moving various movement actions. So you tap on the wasp and then you tap the tap on the hive and then the wasp at the beginning and the wasp at the end and you'll see from the pattern we're testing the direction of all of that important shoulder movement and arm movement in this one uh you have to tap the um with your fingers so they're laid out a bit like a piano keyboard you have to tap them in the right order so you have to remember the order and then tap them in the order and within this sequence of trials there is an implicit sequence that's being taught which um the patients should be getting faster and faster at over time. And this final one is tracking whether you can smoothly trace this line. If you keep your finger right on the smoke, the train continues to move. But if your hand drifts away from the smoke, uh, the train stops completely and you have to get it moving again. So games can be useful for giving a narrative to meaningless, otherwise meaningless tasks or difficult to explain tasks because the fiction can bootstrap the understanding. Other times, gaming, gamification allows us to both train and collect data from children that would otherwise be impossible. These speech reading games were for kids 
uh, between the age of four to six years old. They had to do eight hours of practice on vizemic discrimination. And, and turning these into a games made that a reasonable ask of children, their parents and their teachers. If this hadn't been gamified, you just wouldn't have got the people to show up and do the work. Um, these games, uh, was another thing that was really sweet about these games is, of course, these are for children who are completely deaf. They're being trained on uh, speech reading uh, so that they can better identify phonemes, eventually phonemes, but vizemes in particular in this case. Um, and so we couldn't give auditory instructions because they can't hear and we couldn't give written instructions because they can't read. Um, so everything had to do, be done with little subtle effects on the screen to teach the children how to play the games. Let me show you the video and you can test yourself on your vizemic discrimination. I want you to what a person's face is going to say, turn up here. They're going to say something and I want you to guess what they are saying. If you think you know what they're saying, type it in the chat. It's so much fun to guess. Was it a banana? No. And he vomits. And kids age four think that vomiting as a feedback effect is absolutely hilarious. And they will keep on playing the game for ages. It was a helicopter. And again, farting when you get it right. And the farts would come out in different colours and sometimes rainbow colours, because that is also absolutely hilarious if you're a child. In fair, it's fairly hilarious if you're an adult, but not really. Um, with longitudinal research, we can add trophy cabinets, which aren't strictly within our tasks. So you can keep your task completely vanilla and then add trophy cabinets to encourage people to come back through a longitudinal study and take part in the next session. So in this, um, this was a study we did with researchers at Royal Holloway. Uh, the students needed to uh, read books. They set themselves a, a reading target every week. Um, and then if they met that target at the end of the week, they got a clue for this murder mystery that they were solving on the side. And so as you went through the week, you'd get a new, a new clue and then you would reveal that clue uh, like this. Oh, we haven't, we can't yet, ah, we can unlock the clue. The forensic team found a brown hair that belongs to the suspect. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, and then over the weeks, as you collect these cues, you can work out who committed the robbery. Now, this isn't, this isn't, uh, a massively rewarding game but it's a sort of a step up from um a trophy cabinet where you just have you know like a grid of 15 empty squares and you get a little trophy at the end of each week and people will play just for the trophy cabinet so this is this is a fun just gamified version of the same thing another finally games got can also be a great way of crowdsourcing your data with a little pr or advertising you can collect a lot of data for free See Hero Quest, uh, which is a game created by Hugo Spires um, from UCL, has recorded data from 4.3 million players who have played for a total of 117 years. Collecting 117 years worth of data via a recruitment service such as Prolific, uh, 117 participants, five, uh, 525 thousand ish minutes each at seven pounds 50 per hour would cost over 10 million pounds that's a lot of research data but instead hugo spent a much smaller budget than that on creating the games and uh advertising it um on youtube and got uh all of this data for free similarly lucy cheek is um, using games to collect data on long, long COVID symptoms in kids, looking if looking at whether there is an Im whether there is a cognitive impact um, from COVID in kids. And uh, Xander van der Linden has been using games to inoculate people against fake news and COVID misinformation. So games don't have to be pr frivolous; they can be um, exploring very serious subjects with very real world problems so these games when people play them it stops it it inoculates them against believing fake news and this game helps protect you against COVID-19 misinformation so yeah games aren't necessarily frivolous they can be deeply serious in terms of research value but also in terms of their impact in the world in the short term so before I went through these I I, I asked you and I, to think about whether you've had any of these research challenges. So in your previous research, have you had any of these research challenges? Have you had recruitment difficulties? Have you had done longitudinal research? Have you had to work with kids? Have you had difficulty with attrition? Have had people coming back? Have you had any of those challenges in your work? Type your answer in the chat. Recruitment in general is a problem. Dropout rates, long, boring tasks. 
Yeah, Mitch, you you raise an interesting question about uh, introducing compounds, e.g. unknown effects on participants to do what, like, what impact do the game elements have on the participants' behaviour? And that is a very valuable research question and one that we're hoping to get to later this year. We've got a paper that we're writing about gamification. The headline is, I, I mean, either one has an impact on, on um, games. Like, is a gamified task more like real life? It's got a complicated world with lots of moving parts or are our completely clean tasks more like real life where there's only the visual elements that are actually in play so um and it's going to take some investigation but i don't think they're necessary they might make the data more complicated to analyze but i think it's workable adam's got a question where the visual elements in the examples you're taken from a repository within Grinna? are they open source images did them to respond to testing talent on part of the researcher some of these games that we showed you today um have used artwork from an artist that we hire when we're writing games for people. A lot of these games cost a, a lot of money. So the budget for those ones would have been between, some of those games would have been between like 20 and 250,000 uh, pounds. I think the cheapest one in that set was 20,000 pounds to create it. And the most expensive one in that set was around 250,000 pounds. And the artwork would have been bought in. Um, but you, there are lots of open open source image repositories online now that didn't exist five years ago, and these types of games can now be built far, far more cheaply. So the Lucy Cheat game, this one down here, um, this one here, was created by Lucy herself and her undergraduate students at Cambridge using completely open source images, no artistic requirement on her part. Richard says, most of our tasks are pretty dull and repetitive, to be honest. We had to build game gamification around them for kids so that they were motivated and got different results. Uh, it's great to see these examples, it'll be useful to see how they are implemented. Richard, you're my favourite person now because you've set up exactly the next step. So, um, just, <laughs> you're welcome, thanks Richard. So, my next question to you is what stopped you using gamification? Was it that it was too expensive, too slow, you didn't have access to developers, you didn't know how to do it, You it was too scary? As we've heard earlier, like, Life is pretty overwhelming at the moment. Nobody needs more overwhelm and embracing gamification might just be like, oh my God, that's too hard. It's too much work and, and more overwhelm. So, so what's has stopped you using gamification? Too expensive, too slow, don't know how to do it. Fear, overwhelm, in the chat. Implementation, yeah, didn't know how to do it. Um, so, if if games allow you to increase participant motivation and engagement, and so collect higher quality data, then gamification would be valuable to lots of researchers. So, over the years, we started to ask the question: How can gamified research be brought to researchers at scale? How can we make it so that games are accessible to lots of people? What would that look like? And the solution is to build a game builder tool that's easy enough for researchers to use without needing a developer. An easy to use tool addresses many of the barriers that prevent researchers using gamification. Games are too expensive for many. You can easily spend between 20 and 250,000 pounds. That's a lot of research money. To so to make gamification possible for many, it would need to be a much lower price point. Under 10,000 pounds would be great. Under 1,000 pounds would be amazing. So. That's why we chose to build Game Builder because we wanted to make gamification affordable to many. Games are also slow and fiddly for many research tasks. Um, the iterating back and forth with the developer, particularly if you're using games, it's often a developer who doesn't understand um, psychological research, is a frustrating experience on both sides. Creating a fast and easy to use tool makes it easy for scientists to tweak their protocol as they pilot their tasks without needing to go back to the developer. So a tool makes gamification accessible to many. With tools, we aim for the same level of complexity as PowerPoint or Excel, so we reduce that technical ba barrier, making it accessible. And games in code are very hard to reuse and repurpose for new research projects. Either the code hasn't been maintained, the developer has moved on, or it's just too fiddly. So with a tool, you can separate the game visuals from the trial contents so that it's easier and faster to reuse and so, uh, so that they can be used for new research projects, extensions, replications, and, and that gives the game longevity. So you only need to buy the artwork once and implement the, the game narrative and all of that fiction once, but you can repurpose that game in lots of different situations just by changing the trial contents. So 
Next up, um, so what does a research tool need to do? We've seen lots of different aspects to gamification, theming, narrative, scoring, animations, particle effects, trophy cabinets. But more importantly, it needs to be easy to use, easy to adapt, and easy to share with other researchers. And that's what we've aimed to create with Gorilla Game Builder. So would you like to see how easy it is to design and build a research game? Because that's the next session with Nick. All right, Nick, over to you. Do yeah, you... I'm ready when you are. Yeah, I will stop sharing and you can go on to designing and building games. Fantastic. All right. Um, so uh, thanks so much, Joe, and um, and everybody. So <laughs> I think you know the drill now. Uh, so Joe's talked about all these different scenarios where making games is worth considering. And again, uh, this shouldn't be hard. No one's going to get anywhere if this is just too difficult. So everybody back in your deck chairs, there are two bits to this when it comes to um, games. There's designing a game and there's building a game. So um, last one in the chat, I promise. Um, which one at the moment feels harder to you? Which is more likely to put you off? Is it the designing bit or the building bit? So put either designing or building in the chat uh, and let us know which one you think uh, at the moment is the bit that you're kind of most uh, not looking forward to trying to do. Um, I'll give you a few minutes to think about that. Um, but uh, at least say, I'm gonna show you how to do both of them. So how do you go about designing a game? Um, how do you go from a blank piece of paper to a fun game idea that you can actually go ahead and build? Now, I'm sure some of you might be thinking, designing a game sounds really hard. I don't know where to start. I, I, I don't play games myself, but don't worry. We're, as Joe said, we're making small, simple games for research, not the next Call of Duty. But what we can do is take a lot of the ideas from mainstream games and distill them down to something very simple and accessible. Uh, I spent several years in the game industry before I created Gorilla. I've done all of this loads of times. And by the end of this talk, I'm going to make game designers out of all of you. So how do you design a game? The first thing you need to do is design your fiction. So you need to create a world that the player is in. You need to give the player some kind of agency in that world. And then you need to match the game to your task. Ideally, you want to align the mechanics uh, with the kind of goals that you're setting for your psychological task. Now, if this sounds all very kind of high level and lofty, you can boil it down to just four sentences, all right? Here you go, fill in the blanks. You are in space. You are an astronaut. You have to repair the space station. Uh, watch out for asteroids. Good luck. Simple as that. The second step is to storyboard out your game. This basically just means to draw it out, paper, PowerPoint, whatever works for you, and just sketch out what happens step by step, screen by screen. You probably had some ideas that you were thinking about uh, when you think about your fiction in the first step, so draw those out and kind of add, add to them. Now, this design phase is super important. This is where you work out how the interaction is going to work, and this is crucially where you get rid of 90% of the ideas that sound great, but are, are just going to be too hard or, or too fiddly. Um, Next is art. Now, I think someone asked in the chat earlier, no, we're not going to create any art ourselves. We're just going to find artwork that already exists and just use that. So go to your storyboards, make a list of all the individual props that you drew, and just go shopping for images of them. So Google Image Search is the best place to start. The big stock image sites like Shutterstock have got loads of great options. So you'll probably end up there sooner or later. Um, don't draw them yourself, just use those. Um, it's often worth the small amount of money uh, that it um, that costs to get access to, to those. And, um, and uh, there are, if you, those, that's not an option to you, there are some attribution free ones that you can use. I've done very well with Pixabay that's on my slide there, which has um, free, royalty free, um, attribution free images that you can use. Um, and if you find that you need, that there are too many that you need, go back to your storyboards and simplify. One other thing to bear in mind, you can do an awful lot with just one image. Often you only just need one of anything. As you can see in the top right there, you can make a forest with just one tree change the scale, make some darker or lighter, flip some of them horizontally, and suddenly you've got this nice little forest from just that single graphic. Transparent backgrounds are usually a must because then you can layer them up nicely. And if you, you probably need to do a bit of small in, bit of, uh, of image manipulation to just resize things or crop a few bits out once you've downloaded them. I'm sure you've got some image manipulation software on your computer. If you don't, that photo P down there is a, essentially a clone of Photoshop in the browser that's free to use. So that can be a good option too. Um, and then finally, you need to go ahead and actually build it. So um, 
as I always say, stub out the big parts and then come back to the details later. And I think this applies to everything, but particularly in games, something's not working or it's too hard to get it look right. Take a step back and see if there's an easier way. Go back to your storyboards if you need to change how a sequence works or consider a different piece of art if you can't get it to look right. And this is often quite an organic process. And then finally, piloting. So obviously the you always pilot the task, but I think specifically with games, there's the main things you want to ask yourself are, first of all, do people understand what to do? What do you need to put into instructions and what's just obvious from the context? Is any of your art confusing or distracting? Maybe some things are ambiguous or there's too much movement in the background. And finally, is it fun? Now, obviously we're doing all this for research, but is it satisfying and engaging to play? Are people gonna to want to get to the end of it? All right, so now it's your turn to have a go. Get a piece of paper and write out those four statements that um, that uh, that, uh, that we said earlier. Uh, think of a task that you're working on right now or a task you've, you've run in the past and have a go at coming up with a setting for a gamified version of it. Okay, I'll give you some time to do that and we'll, we'll try and maybe we'll hear a few of those at the end. So write those down. You are in somewhere. You are a something. You have to do something. Watch out for some kind of, some kind of hazard or, or antagonist. Um, and just that template will, will give you enough to go on. So that's the designing side. Um, now, now, the second bit is to show you um, how easy it is to put these things together. And I there's a bit of a warning here that this might slightly ruin games for you because once you can see behind the scenes of kind of how they're made, some of the magic is gonna fall away. So I'm sorry about that, um, but uh, we wanna see how this stuff is done. So this is our new game builder tool and at the core of it, um, it does a lot, a lot of the similar things that the task builder does as well, where you can put in images and move them around, but the core of it is the animation system. And I want to show you what that looks like. So here I've got a rabbit. Uh, this is just a graphic that I found uh, off, off of Pixabay, actually, I think. Um, and I set up an animation sequence that showcases a lot of the basic ones in there. So you can make it move up and down, you can scale it up and down, you make it spin, you can fade it in and out. And you build all of these things in our animation tool. So this is um, very similar to the one in PowerPoint. So you can see that little cascade of animation that we put together there. Uh, you can add new ones from our big list of them. Um, there's all sorts of different effects in there. And you can click on them to just change their durations. And there are various other properties. And you can just drag them to move them around. Okay. So uh, this makes it really super easy to build little um, animations. So I've moved the spin to the front. So now that happens first before we go through the rest of them. So just using animations, I want to show you what you can create. So, oops. Um, so here we go. In this game, you're the rabbit and there are two trees. Uh, you want to press left as the apple is on the left and right is on the right, but you also want to avoid the fox. If you get it wrong, he's going to say, hey, there's no apple there and disappear off the screen. Um, and uh, there's the crafty fox. Uh, in this case, we get it right, but sometimes there might be an apple, but in both trees and the fox, in which case you need to make sure you get the right one. If you go for the fox, it's going to say, hey, oh no, there's a fox. I'm not going there. So that obviously happened quite quickly. Let's watch that again. And we'll and I'll, I'll just shout out the animations that are going on. So here we go. So that's a move with a scale to make a little haste going into the screen. The apple fades in and moves up a bit. The rabbit then moves over to the tree. The apple moves down and then the, and then the uh, rabbit moves back again. When we show the feedback, it simply fades in and does a little pulse and then it fades back out again. The fox is similar to the apple. When we want the fox in the trial, the fox just fades in and slides, slides out to the right so that we see him. Um, so all you're doing is layering all those different things up. Um, I'm not going to show you the, building the whole thing, but I want to show you the first few steps of building it so you can see how easy it is. So here we go, starting from a completely blank slate. Um, we go ahead and add the first scene. So this is going to be our trial scene where, where all the things I just showed you are going to happen. And the first thing we do is put our tree in. So let's create a sprite. A sprite is just a kind of game word for an image. Um, we'll add a new image, which is going to be our tree. So there it is. And um, we can then move it around. We can obviously scale it if we want to. Uh, and we can give it a name. Uh, I'm going to call this tree left because we're going to have, we're going to, and I was going to end up with two, but I'm just going to start doing one on the left. And then we're going to make an animated sprite, which has got a sprite and an animator on it, uh, which is going to be our apple. So we'll drag the apple in there. Um, there we go. Goodness me, that's rather enormous. Let's just scale it down a bit so it's a decent size. We'll put it roughly where we want it to be. And then we're going to go ahead and animate it. So we open our animation tool. We'll add a new clip, which we're going to call appear. This is when the apple just appears on the, on the screen. Um, and we want it to fade in. So we want it to start um, invisible. We're going to want to fade in and then just sort of move up a little bit to give it a bit of motion to draw our attention to it. 
So we add in a, add in a move to position animation, give it a coordinates and a duration. Um, and now what we can do is um, we want to start invisible. So let's just put that property on there as well. Um, and then finally, we want to play that appear animation at the start of the trial. So let's sell that up. We can then preview it straight in here and we can see, there you go. Uh, let's see that again. The apple fades in and rises up when we start the, when we start the trial. So, and everything else you saw in that sequence um, was uh, was just doing repeating that process over and over again, just making a, a little stack of animations and moving things around to basically create that narrative flow for the fix that we created. Uh, let's see some other examples. So again, we're going to do the same exercise. We're going to look at some of the ones that Joe showed you before. Um, so here's these this ones again. The balloons have just got a swaying back and forth animation. It's on a loop. And you can see every time we pop one, we get this sort of puff of bits of balloon. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Here's the, the bees, Joe, not wasps. <laughs> um, here's the bee one. So again, you can see there's a pot animation. The flowers have got the same swaying that you saw on the balloons. And you can see that when, the, when you're too slow to get the bee, there's a move and a fade, um, which is what we saw before. Here are the fireworks again. So again, that um, that uh, the spark uh, effect is just moving down the, the string, uh, down the fuse, and then they start to pulse when it's time to launch them. So that's the pulse effect you saw again. Um, and then they they move up and, and scale down, which makes them look like they're going kind of into the sky and then finally explode in another big puff of, uh, a puff of fireworks. Uh, here you can see more of these particles again. So the smoke from the train, uh, whenever we hold our finger over there, the smoke starts to billow out of the, of the funnel to make it so that we know the train is, is moving um, and otherwise it's just following this path around. So the, the other new thing we've shown here is what are called particle systems, which is the, the smoke here, the stars, the, the fireworks that we saw before. So that's the other main thing in the game board that, that's called. This is a particle system. So fundamentally what they are, they're used for these kind of things like stars, fire, smoke, and you have a single image. So in this case, a star. And what it does is it keeps emitting lots of them continuously. And you can control like how fast they move, how fast they spin and fade out. So I want my stars to go a bit faster. I can increase the speed. If I want more of them, I can change the rate at which they're spawned. Uh, and you can change this and see all of your changes manifest here in real time. Um, you can do other things like, for example, if I want them to move more slowly but last for longer, I can reduce the speed but increase the duration. And so now they're starting to, you can see how they're starting to uh, move further away, but um, they're going much more slowly. We can increase the spin rate. And now you can see how we've turned this sort of puff of stars into sort of continuous kind of almost twinkling effect. Um, here's a smoke effect. What I like about this one is that this is using uh, this gravity idea to essentially suck the, the clouds upwards. We've essentially got a negative gravity setting on there so that the, the puffs of cloud go up. If I turn that off, you'll see it looks more like the stars when we start just emanating from a central point, but that's not what smoke looks like. Um, so what we can do is we can put a negative gravity on there so that the things gradually move up and actually upping it a bit, you can start to see how that looks like the kind of smoke that might come out of a fire. Um, so that's how those work. <clears throat> Um, let's look at another one. So again, this is the one we have from before. Um, oops, sorry, I'm all just playing for me. Um, so here's this one again. So there's the pulse effect on the button, um, and then we hear the audio, and then when we drag it in, uh, there's your pulse effect for the stars. And then what you're seeing there, the way you move everything up, is you can simply group a whole bunch of objects together in Game Builder. So when we drop it into the into place, we essentially attach it to that square, and then the whole thing moves up. And that's how we get to animate everything up and out. Um, the way we get that effect to make it look like a cave is actually black banners across the top and the sides so that we've got something for our, our cave door to actually go up behind. But they're all just layered up on top of each other. Um, it's a really simple effect, but it works really, really well. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the treasure collector game. Um, we have uh, a lot of the same kind of ideas. And again, what we've got here is these kind of filler screens, which aren't actually tasks in themselves, but we're using all the same techniques to do it to allow us um, to create these bits of story and these bits of narrative. So we can use the same tools to essentially just create bits of um, what are called either cutscenes or, um, or or bits of sort of um, narrative that is coming out so that we can, we can tell the story, even though we're not actually doing anything. Um, Again, here's the mining game. So you can see there's a, an animation being played on the pickaxe and the fade animation being played on the rocks. And then there's a simple trick where we just simply open and shut the bag just by changing it from a closed bag to an open bag. Here's the dragon one. Again, you can see it's the same thing. We've got the fade and we've got the movement of the coins and the score going up. Um, there's the dragon. Um, we avoided it that time. And this time when we get it wrong, he comes up and then that's just a passive effect coming out of his mouth. And there we've got the gravity pulling down so that it comes out downwards from his mouth. 
this is one of my favorite effects, the driving game. Um, the way this works is the Jeep isn't actually moving. The way you make it look like the Jeep's moving is by actually moving the cactuses down the screen, not moving the, the Jeep and the road up. Uh, the only time the Jeep moves is this bit at the very, very end of the trial. So the Jeep is completely static. It's only when we actually then uh, get to the actual trial bit that we then show the fork in the road and make the Jeep actually move up the screen. But most of the rest of the time, it's just the cactuses going down the screen really quickly. Now, again, we've got lots of tutorials and examples on how to do all these kind of effects and a lot and an awful lot of it is all smoke and mirrors. Um, it's almost always either simple little animations, moving the background and not the main thing that you're uh, looking at um, and layering things on top of each other. So a lot of making things go behind each other or obscure from view is you're really just layering things up and moving something behind something else. Uh, and finally, as I said, I've shown you um, games which haven't, haven't used a lot of more kind of cartoony style artwork, but they don't have to be. There's nothing stopping you using real images, photographs, instead of the kind of uh, cartoon elements um, that I've used here. Um, so um, there you go. Those are all possible in Game Builder. Uh, it's out now, so you can have a go yourself um, when uh, if you if you already have a Grillo account, you want to sign up for one. So before we go on to those final bits to, to tell you all about, uh, are there any questions about uh, the things I've just showed you? Can you, uh, is there anything you're still finding hard to imagine how to do? And can you imagine using this in your research? Um, I'm just going to bring the chat back up. Nick, um, I have a question for you. Like, yes. Because you, you I, I saw, we saw you putting together one little animation, which was really quick. Mm -hmm. um, but like, how long would it take to create a whole game? Like if we needed to create the little balloon popping game, like is that a day's work, a week's work? What, like how long does it oh, take? Oh, yes, hours or a couple of days. I think the rabbit one that I showed you, I think that took about a day tops. Um, the, the full rabbit with the with the fox. Behind. With the rabbit and the fox and all those and other all bits and pieces. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, I think the the comparison we draw is, and the, what, indeed what we sort of modeled a lot of this tooling on is indeed the animation tools in um, in PowerPoint. Um, and I'm sure many, most people here have had a go with those. And I think you know how easy it is to simply make a few things appear or slide onto the screen. So it's really just that. And I think certainly um, uh, the other thing that I think makes it easy is that um, it's not like for each different part of that task, you have to come up with a new novel approach. A lot of it is the same trick over and over again. So once you've done the first few, um, and you, so once you made the apple appear and rise up, it's actually no different to make the apple fall down where the, where the bunny then collects it. So, um, so yeah, so certainly it's hours, it's hours and possibly days, but certainly not weeks and months. Um, that to put it together. So, I mean, Richard was the one who very generously said he'd like to see some examples. Richard, have I satisfied your curiosity to show you some <laughs> examples of how these are put together? Sorry to put you on the spot. Yes, thanks. Excellent. Everybody else in the room, like what, how do you feel about gamification? Uh, yeah, Mitchell, yes, you can embed Unity within Gorilla. Yes, and then we've got, um, we've done a project like that and we've got some more, we've got some more and better tooling for doing that um, uh, coming later this year. But um, yes, that's one of the things that we want to add in. Or, or you can just use Gorilla Game Builder, it, but it might be that you already have your, your um, game built in Unity. Mm -hmm. uh, is Game Builder included as standard if your institution has a Gorilla account? No, it's an add-on. You'll probably need to go and talk to the department administrator, um, the Gorilla administrator, to see um, to see if you can get it added, or you could buy it yourself for yourself or for your lab. If you want to find out more about Gorilla Game Builder, I've just put a link into the chat. Um, then there's this little question where we ask you for your email address. Um, and to tick which things you're interested in. Um, and then we will get in touch with you and sort you out with the information you need so that you can go and talk to your department administrator or purchase it with your by your PI or, or your lab. Uh, Adam, or, just to build on that, it's, um, it's so yes, you need the license to run a study with it and collect data, but it, um, you don't need the license in order to, to just open it up and try it out. So you can, you can create a game builder task today um, and start building things. But yes, you will need a license when you actually want to run your study with it. All right. So, well, thank you everyone for coming. So just to wrap up that, so there's that find out more link that Joe mentioned. So uh, if there's anything that we've mentioned here that you just like a bit more information on, uh, or there's more things you'd like to know, go to gorilla.se slash find out more uh, about there, there's grants and workshops and everything that we put on there. Um, Secondly, Be Online is this year. We'll be on Tuesday, the 5th of July. Uh, do go to beonlineconference.com to sign up there. It's our online conference, fully, fully virtual, all about online behavioral research methods. So do come to that.
And finally, if you're if you'd like to give Gorilla a go, we're doing a promo code for this event, which is UKRNGOR, so UKRN Gorilla uh, 2022. So when you sign up, do add that in, and that will give you some extra tokens uh, on your first purchase. Um, so I'll give you uh, a few seconds to write down any of those that you want. Um, Joe's going to put them in the chat as well. Um, and otherwise, I think I'd like to say thank you all so much for coming and listening to everything that we had here. And um, I'll hand you back to Joe uh, to, to say goodbye. Hello, everyone. Well, thank you so much for listening to us today talk about participant engagement and gamification for research. I hope you found it useful. Um, if there are any questions that you have, do feel free to contact me on Twitter. Um, uh, or Nick indeed on Twitter uh, but that's it from us today um, yeah now thank you Paul thank you for being a great audience and for uh, uh, answering our questions and for staying and listening to um, to what we had to say you're very welcome <laughs>